We're four friends who live across the globe and share a love of Bon Appetit's YouTube channel. So we came together to bring you our thoughts on what BA serves up and try our hands at recreating their dishes. Welcome to Pod Appetit. Hey, it's Justine. Hey, it's LJ. And it's me, Meg. Welcome back to another episode of Pod Appetit. As you may have heard just now, Amanda is not with us. She's out sick. So we're wishing her the very best and a speedy recovery. And we'll miss having you here, Amanda. And we hope that you, our listeners, are staying safe and staying home if possible. And thank you for choosing Pod Appetit to keep you company and keep you in good spirits, hopefully. And we're glad that we get to share this balm to our souls that is Bon Appetit. (laughs) I'm super Mm -hmm. impressed at anyone who is keeping up with us because I am really struggling with my podcast listening at the moment, personally, like to keep up with my fave. So anytime anyone listens to us, I'm like, thank you so much. (laughs) I know know the struggle is real. And I know a lot of people listen to podcasts on their commute. Yeah. And if you take the commute out of the equation, well. But we're going to (laughs) start off every episode like we always do, talking about what we've been up to cooking-wise, culinary-wise. Sometimes we talk about restaurants we go to, but I guess that won't be the case this time. Justine, what have you been cooking? I made Chris Morocco's blueberry miso crumb cake. Mm. I had a bunch of frozen blueberries. Uh, I know, you know, you're supposed to use fresh, but hey, in these times, <laughs> you use what you have. <laughs> you do what you can. In this economy. <laughs> yeah. It was good. I was like, do I like it or do I like it okay? Can't tell. On the fence. Who knows? But it is good. <laughs> like, <laughs> But would I make it again? Maybe. <laughs> I've yet to make any of their miso desserts. So how do you find the miso in a sweet? It just adds like salt, pretty much. Mm-hmm. It's just in the crumble of this. So every once in a while, you're just hit with like an extra like, ooh, salty bit, you know? Mm-hmm. I would say if you're planning on making this recipe, read the comments because people had some difficulty making it. I had already used my springform pan instead of a regular cake pan. And I'm glad I did because it makes a lot and it would have been spilling out and making a mess in my oven if I did not. Mm. Oh, nice. Good tip. Good to know. Yeah. (laughs) What about you, LJ? Well, I've made two things. Um, The first thing is the ninth recipe of the 10 basically baking stack. (laughs) I don't know what they call it, package of recipes. Um, It's Sola's triple threat onion galette. I made it for dinner last night. Um, I did take all the necessary... media in order to story it which I will do at some point this evening um but (laughs) I was skeptical about this one because I thought well how delicious can it be for those who don't know the recipe it's basically um the the difficult bit is making the pastry the pastry is made from scratch um and then it's the galette consists of a nicely kind of sauteed slow sauteed um onions and garlic so that it's nice and jammy and delicious and sort of just starting to brown um and then you top that with these like shards of scallions because they're cut really I mean you don't have to do this this is purely for aesthetics and and Solo admits that in the recipe but you you cut it at a really really steep bias to make them kind of really like these spindly little shards that you pile on the top yeah so that's what the galette filling is like um I was worried about the pastry because I've never made galette pastry before the recipe warns you throughout that the key to getting flaky pastry um is keeping the butter super 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 cold and it's been quite a warm weekend and my flat is hotter than the sun (laughs) so (laughs) I was kept putting it in and out of the fridge to try and keep the butter and the dough once the butter was in the dough as cold as I possibly possibly could um her butter stays in bigger kind of chunks than mine seemed to mine seemed to incorporate a lot more quickly I guess because my butter was not as cold as as it should have been so I was really worried that it would despite my kind of running backwards and forwards to the fridge I was really worried that it, it would be a complete disaster but it wasn't it was absolutely delicious and flaky and I would say if anyone's you know feeling intimidated by the recipe to just give it a go because it's actually a lot more simple than you think and 
yes, it's a bit of a pain trying to keep your butter cold, but like I didn't do it exactly as shown and it still turned out nice. So like I didn't manage to keep it as cold as, as they probably wanted me to, but it still was delicious. So I highly recommend that. It doesn't take too long from a baking standpoint to do because it's not like you have to wait for it to prove or anything like that it's just literally you make the pastry leave it in the fridge to chill whilst you make the filling and then you just assemble it and put it in the oven so it's uh I guess a couple of hours work so you'll see that on our stories very soon the second thing I made was a lunch recipe which was a real dark horse I have to say um I chose it because I was looking for something to do with um I've got loads of cans of butter beans in my pantry for some reason um I haven't been purposefully stocking up I think I just keep forgetting that I have them and then I've been buying them for like recipes in the past and now I'm like oh let's use up stuff in my pantry so I don't have to buy too much stuff and it was a recipe for big beans and tomato vinaigrette which um is in the healthy-ish part of the site it's actually a recipe for dried butter beans but I kind of MacGyvered the recipe so that I didn't have to do that because mine are obviously canned so the dried butter bean part of the recipe was to soak the butter beans in like a brothy kind of stock liquid and, and bring that to the boil and cook that right right down um until the beans are nice and tender and can be used in like a salad but I didn't do that I sauteed my canned butter I drained them and sauteed them in a pan with the same herbs that they were calling for in that kind of broth so to give a similar kind of flavor and I did it with some onion as well and then you basically make a vinaigrette by zhuzhing up some cherry tomatoes with some garlic and red wine vinegar and olive oil and then chopping some bigger tomatoes as like your base layer of your salad you mix your beans and the cherry tomato vinaigrette into one kind of mixture spoon that over your tomatoes and then like top it with like basil and red pepper flakes and it was so I was just like this is so simple how delicious can this be but it turns out if you add enough olive oil and salt to something it's absolutely amazing and the tomatoes tasted great I was really impressed with the vinaigrette the beans tasted amazing and it was just a really delicious lunch I had it for two days so that was my life. Wow. It was <laughs> like I was there. <laughs> yeah, that sounds really nice and refreshing. Was that a recipe by one of the chefs that we know or was it just no, a recipe? No, it's a recipe by someone called Kelly Mariani who uh, is from Scribe Winery in Sonoma. Yeah, sounds great. And hopefully you still have some stuff on hand to make pantry pasta. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. Because, uh, yeah, they had gave us some really good ideas, didn't they? But let's not skip ahead. How about you, Meg? What have you made? Have you made anything? <laughs> so I guess I'll just have to live vicariously through you guys. I have never made more meals a day in my life than now. But somehow I haven't made so few Bon Appetit recipes. I've literally made no Bon Appetit recipes. It's really difficult to get my hands on just ingredients in general. The last grocery order that I made when I went to pick it up, they had fulfilled less than half of what I had ordered. So not really making a bunch of recipes with any sort of special ingredients. Been making a lot of meal kit dinners. The one recipe that I did enjoy making was from my childhood, essentially, when I was a kid, my family and I would go to this Mexican restaurant called El Pollo Asado, and my mom made a copycat recipe, essentially, of their stewed beans. So I made these low and slow beans over the stovetop. Mm. In our family, we call it the El Pollo beans, even though there's not actually any chicken in it <laughs> except for chicken <laughs> stock. But they're really good beans, really hearty. I tend to add bacon it's really tasty. So that was probably the highlight of my cooking for the past couple of weeks. Nice. I was able to get tempeh finally in a <gasps> in a grocery order. It's been over a month. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh man. I Glad you got pleased. some. Yay. All right. So let's move on to recapping. On the menu for today's episode, we have pro chefs share their favorite kitchen tools, test kitchen talks at home. Andy makes Neapolitan chicken from the test kitchen. Pro chefs take you on a tour of their kitchens, test kitchen talks at home, pastry chef attempts to make gourmet Cadbury cream eggs, gourmet makes, pro chefs make 13 kinds of pantry pasta, test kitchen talks at home, yet again, 
Brad makes garlic ginger paste. It's alive at home. Trying everything on the menu at a famous New York City sandwich shop featuring Christina Che. Pro chef tries butchering a whole pig for the first time. And finally, three chefs cook pasta carbonara three ways. Traditional, modern, experimental. So let's start with pro chefs share their favorite kitchen tools. Our first of many test kitchen talks at home. I will say the programming, I like the second week better than the first week. Oh, really? I was thinking that through no fault of theirs, I think the content is great, but I'm already starting to like the at home talks a little bit less only because I'm tired of being stuck at home and I feel like I'm now just (laughs) stuck in someone else's home. (laughs) It's really nice to get videos in the test kitchen or in a restaurant because then I feel like I'm going somewhere, but... That's really my only reservation on these videos is just I wish everyone could go out. <laughs> I don't like that they're all like 30 minute episodes now. Oh, because yeah, they that's have true. to cover like, what is it, 13 chefs now? They're like, well, we've got everybody. We can't just split these up into like two separate categories. Everybody has to show us their thing or whatever the topic is. And I'm like, these are all really long episodes now there's no more like 15 minute episodes i was thinking that too and i felt a little bit uncharitable because i thought to myself well maybe they don't need to show everyone (laughs) maybe they could edit out some people but then that wouldn't really be fair and it it would be really really subjective as to what was entertaining and what wasn't so i'd feel bad if anyone got cut that's, that's so interesting because I found that the Test Kitchen Talks at Home are starting to become some of my favourite videos because I'm really enjoying seeing their home lives um, and a little glimpse into them. Um, I think you're right. I think they're really long and I know why because they've obviously got loads of them to get through because I think naturally in the Test Kitchen uh, normally um, you don't need you don't get everyone in the test kitchen in uh, you know yeah. you know some people are out shooting stuff elsewhere like Rick's been driving around or Mexico they would them for seven up. months yeah exactly mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. but I wonder if there's something they can do to try and get you know an equal amount of coverage but not necessarily have everyone in every topic every video yeah that's what I was saying yeah maybe like half of you do this topic the other half of you do a different topic yeah yeah but I I'm really enjoying seeing them at home because I'm like oh it's you know you're going through the same thing I am and I feel like that camaraderie a bit more rather than it being like me just watching people that I don't really know but pretending that I do know them I just feel like it (laughs) makes me closer to them but that's really lame so (laughs) I do like these little glimpses that make me feel like, oh, I feel like I can identify with them or maybe we'd be friends. You know, I love Chris in this video talking about the Night King meme. I feel like Chris (laughs) is really plugged into the fandom, maybe more so than some of the other chefs. Yeah. I thought that was hilarious. And I really liked his pick of his most favorite tool, although I was shocked that he did not pick a spoon. Yes. I guess he (laughs) didn't want to be pigeonholed. But I also love my salt box. It's very convenient to have around instead of just a giant box of salt. Yes. Well, I don't have one of those salt box things and I haven't really seen them until like seeing all in the chef's kitchens. But like, I'm like, oh, but then like your fingers are always in that salt. Like, is that weird? But I guess you're always just supposed to have clean fingers. You definitely should have clean hands if you're cooking. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But I mean, like... You're touching other things, you're getting things out of the fridge and whatever. So like each time you salt something, do you wash your hands? I actually do. do. Yeah, I um, usually because, you know, if I've got something on my hands, I don't want that going in the salt pig because I call I have a salt pig. I don't have a salt box. I don't know if that's only a phrase that we use in the UK, but it's basically the same idea. Um, But um, uh, yeah, I if I'm I've got like oil or I've just been touching meat or something, you know, every every time I touch meat, I and I know I'm not going to touch it again for a while or, or at all. I will always wash my hands regardless of whether I'm salting anything or not. But mm-hmm. I'm very conscious of flavoring being on my hands from another ingredient and my salt. I'll either have one hand that I'm using to touch whatever it is that I'm salting and the other hand is the salt hand and then mm-hmm. I'll wash. And if it, I've got both hands dirty, I'll always wash. But the other re- that's the other reason that chefs, I guess, and my dad taught me this actually. My dad always has, a uh, tea towel um, on his belt loop or something like that so that he can wipe off before he goes to 
to salt if it's just something that doesn't necessarily need washing but you do want to kind of get rid yeah. of something so i think you see that the test kitchen guys do that a lot certainly in the test kitchen i love hearing these basic basic skills because i'm like <laughs> how do you get from point a to point b you know like, <laughs> wash your hands when point b seems so obvious to people you know <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't think it is obvious to everyone. You're right. And I just think it's sometimes it's these little things that uh, chefs often take for granted that people will just figure out. And I don't think that's mm-hmm. the case unless someone tells you and you're like, oh, of course. And after you've been told, it seems so obvious. But, you know, nothing's obvious unless you know it right. Yeah. And then it just becomes natural. Yeah. But speaking of pairing off people, I guess Brad and Andy should have been paired since they both picked the microplane. Yes. What I learned from this video, my main takeaway is I really do need a microplane, an offset spatula, and a fish press. But not apparently to press any fish um just to use on grilled cheese sandwiches and vegetables oh yeah i wanted that so badly after she mentioned grilled cheese i thought that would be so So perfect and then i made a grilled cheese later that day and really regretted not having a fish press (laughs) it's such a i've never even considered having one before but she's made it seem like something that's every kitchen should have that's indispensable yeah yeah (laughs) Well, the fact that she said that it's good for crispy mashed potato, smashed potatoes, mm. I was like, mm, crispy yeah. smashed potatoes. <laughs> right. I guess we all need a fish press now. <laughs> mm-hmm. I really liked that Carla had the Escali digital scale because I have that exact same digital scale down to the color. So I felt very in tune with Carla. I'm here for the digital mm-hmm. scales crew. Uh, I'm so glad everyone else is coming around. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I thought it was interesting the, uh, the the choice of the garlic press. I've just thrown out my garlic press because of Bon Appetit because they've made me see that a knife is actually way easier because once you've smashed the garlic with the back of your knife to get the skin off and release the allicin, as we all know, like what do you really <laughs> need a press for? Really, like your your knife's right there. Like just just. I still like my press for mincing. I really hate mincing with a knife. It takes so long. But any other form of cutting the garlic, I will just cut it instead of using the press. Mm. Mm, Garlic press controversy. (laughs) (laughs) Opposite opinion. Yeah, I was just going to say that. (laughs) (laughs) I was also really shocked that Andy didn't choose mortar and pestle, but Rick did. And also, Rick did not have a manicure, which shows that we are truly oh. in troubling times. In the end, <laughs> the end times. of days. <laughs> well, there is something going on with Andy where nobody is quite sure, like, where he is, who right? he's with, and, yeah. like, what this... his general, like, attitude is. I think <laughs> like, that... are you okay, Andy? I'm really worried about him. I really want to know the story, because he's, like, not in his apartment but he's Mm -hmm. still in new york he seems to be living with someone Mm -hmm. do i mean what do you guys what's your theory (laughs) so my best theory is a short-term partner and maybe he's reluctant to be like this is who i'm with right now (laughs) but that is pure speculation but it's obviously not his house it does not seem to be a family members in the other video all he does is critique the entire kitchen (laughs) I know. It's just very... All the comments are like, are you okay, Andy? (laughs) Right? Are you being held against your will somewhere? He's also doing the um, healthy-ish, like, regular series um, on the site, uh, the healthy-ish guide to being alone um, at the moment, which Mm -hmm. is interesting. So it's like, I think I went where you went, Meg. I assume that it's like a partner that either he hasn't known very long or maybe didn't Mm -hmm. intend for it to last that long. (laughs) but decided to make the call to like lock down there and maybe is regretting it I don't know <laughs> but I don't know it's I just I'm so curious so curious me too <laughs> so speaking of Andy next up we have Andy makes Neapolitan chicken from the test kitchen I don't know why they didn't just call this chicken putinesca. That is my is. first note. Because <laughs> I, why? Yeah, same, same. <laughs> I said, why did he introduce it as chicken putinesca? And then I clicked on it. I said, oh, because that's the name of the recipe. <laughs> yeah, I've, because that's so what it is. <laughs> this renaming of recipes for some the SEO algorithm. that they're chasing. Like, I, I, 
I surely chicken puttanesca is more recognizable as a name of a dish that you might be searching yeah. for than Neapolitan chicken. I don't know about you guys, and I don't know if this is a thing in the US or if it's just a UK thing, but Neapolitan to me is chocolate vanilla strawberry ice cream. Yeah, ice cream, right? exactly. <laughs> yes. And I'm just like, why would anyone be searching for that with chicken? No one does that, surely. <laughs> Maybe they already have too many puttanesca chicken recipes and they decided not to compete with themselves. Well, then don't make another video Mm. about it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Have you seen how many chicken soup recipes they have? Yeah. My God. And it's fine. I don't mind (laughs) another one. It looked delicious. So I'm just irritated that they're not just, you know, filing it correctly. Yeah, puttanesca is really hit or miss for me. I sometimes really like it, sometimes really don't. But this recipe looked particularly good, especially the Castle Vetrano olives. Mm. I like those olives so much more than Kalamata's in Puttanesca. I do like Kalamata's, but it's just not my favorite type yeah. of olive for this recipe. I also love how Andy is consistently making Italian tomato-based sauces without a single tomato. <laughs> <laughs> he's just all about that tomato paste <laughs> oh the paste yeah for sure this kitchen that. loves the paste they do they really do they use so much mm-hmm. of it like if i'm following a test kitchen recipe i'm like well that's my tube out like i need to buy another one yeah <laughs> <laughs> i also find it interesting when we see which chefs watch the shows and which don't because andy asked brad if he'd ever been to italy and it's like, um, hello, do you not watch It's Alive going places? Because I have. <laughs> <laughs> I really um, noticed in this uh, video how much I really like Andy saying saucy the way he says it. He's always like, saucy. <laughs> <laughs> I just picked up on it and was like, why do I like it so much? And I was just like, I've always liked it, but I've never really acknowledged that before. Um, but yeah, he just said it a lot in this video. And I was like, every time, it's so funny. You sound so sassy. <laughs> Maybe because he really identifies with that word. Because he's very saucy. <laughs> so saucy. Uh, the video felt really long to me. Wasn't it only like 11 minutes or something? <laughs> I don't know. It felt. <laughs> just felt long. It just seems like, how long can I sit and watch someone make chicken? <laughs> I don't know. I can watch people do, like, coming up later, the Molly taking apart the pig. You thought I'd hate that, but oh, I liked it because it was entertaining. I'm so yeah. Okay, cool. This felt long. <laughs> I guess Andy, maybe of the chefs, isn't the most playful with his recipe videos maybe that's why he just is kind of straight to the point Mm -hmm. although he did have that funny little thing about how he wants to smash an electric guitar in front of an audience apparently (laughs) lifelong dream (laughs) he's good when he's playing off other people as well like when he was asking sola to come and taste it and then he was like i'm not asking you Sola. (laughs) like just come (laughs) over here um i thought you know he does he's he's an interesting personality to kind of i guess portray in a video as the kind of producing side of it because he's 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 yeah. not exactly the loud brash like uh personality but yeah it feels he's like nice. he's just like hanging out with like the guys on set like he's just there hanging out with them showing them a thing instead of like carla as we know like reaches through the screen like captures our attention make sure that mm-hmm. we know what she's doing in an entertaining way yeah he did say that they looked like they were dancing the chicken legs. So I did enjoy that, at least. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Andy, show us your weird house. Pro chefs take you on a tour of their kitchens. <laughs> Test kitchen talks at home. I don't know why they didn't have this one before the other one. Yeah, like introduce mm. us to the space and then introduce us yeah. to recipes and tools. Yeah, that would make sense. I got so much apartment kitchen inspiration from watching this video I think that's the benefit of having a bunch of chefs at home in tiny New York kitchens for the most part um I particularly got a lot of ideas about how to store spices because that is the bane of my Mm -hmm. life I need Mm -hmm. I obviously need to start labeling everything um I also need to start you know seeing my freezer as not kind of long-term decades long storage but more of like a short-term thing where things move in and out more easily (laughs) because um they're all dealing with 
much tinier freezers than mine yet somehow I never have room in my freezer for anything yeah I just thought this was a really really super useful video um and uh not one we maybe ever would have got if this hadn't happened um as in lockdown um so I was really pleased to have it I just got a lot of kitchen envy because I do have a really <laughs> small kitchen. <laughs> I feel like my kitchen is most like Chris's. Actually, I think we have identical cabinets except for the handles. Wow. And I'm 99% sure that we have an identical fridge. Do you have identical Pokemon cards and Lego in your kitchen? <laughs> <laughs> if my nephews happen to be visiting me, then yes, but not at this current moment. <laughs> I like some common themes. Everyone really makes use of those labels. And yes. it's very encouraging to know that literally everyone has a junk drawer in the whole wide world. Yes. <laughs> oh my God. Tupperware storage is the bane of my life as well. I need a kitchen with more drawers I think I don't have enough I have lots of cabinets I don't have drawers so yeah I think I need to think about that oh man Sola's spice cabinet category mm. labeling system so good <laughs> it was intense <laughs> so good. well do you want to share what you spied among her <laughs> yeah I'm not sure if anybody else saw but when she was pointing direction to the thing on screen right center screen there was a little bottle labeled weed <laughs> And someone on Twitter said that um, it was probably dill weed. And I'm just like, sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you tell yourself that. <laughs> yeah, I didn't notice that the first time I watched through. <laughs> I also love Spine and Sola's Kitchen that she had a Tobias Funke sticker on her fridge from Arrested Development. So I feel like we're kindred spirits. <laughs> nice. Christina has the nicest kitchen. Oh, we're judging kitchens now. <laughs> <laughs> That's the whole point of this. <laughs> um, yeah, I think she seems to have quite a spacious kitchen for a New York kitchen. Um, mm -hmm. I know she shares, she doesn't live alone. I loved seeing uh, the little personal touches i guess um so like gabby's little piggy bank or her owly bank that was really <laughs> cute um and you know yeah as you say the different um crazy random junk drawers so chris's tupperware drawer was just so relatable um the different like closet pantry type situations that everybody had yeah. was quite interesting gabby's mm -hmm. like disgust at needing to show all of these extra areas like the fridge and the pantry was hilarious because she was like oh, i've not cleaned them <laughs> don't judge me <laughs> I, I like how gabby funny. called hers a walk-in pantry although yes. i think that was only walk-in if you are gabby she is so small yeah. <laughs> she's so funny and then she was like this shouldn't be here this go-to junk shouldn't be <laughs> <laughs> like everything's in the wrong order. I think she was worried that people would be like, but you're a test kitchen manager and you're right. not managing your own kitchen. <laughs> it looked very organized to my eyes. Yeah, to mine too, definitely. I also really like Christina's kitchen. It looks so cute. I love yeah. the mushrooms poster. I spotted that in the favorite tools video and I yeah. just love that. It's cute. Delaney's record collection. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that he just went straight in there. I was like, I don't know where anything is in this kitchen it is nothing to me i'm just gonna share with you my records <laughs> he didn't even try as the little editorial said what is even happening right now and that's exactly <laughs> mm -hmm. what i felt mm -hmm. uh, i also want to judge priya's family for having the label disposable cups i was like why why don't you just wash some glasses yeah. <laughs> I didn't understand that because like if you're all isolating together, you're not social distancing from each other. So there's no yes. need to do that, right? I yes. Don't know. If you're sharing a house together, sorry, but you're sharing germs. I don't think disposable cups is going to make much of a difference at no. that point. And she sneezed on them. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, That's why you just take a glass from the cabinet, use it, wash it. Like... Yeah, exactly. 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 I love seeing everyone's <laughs> random children um, in the background. <laughs> random children, random pets. I, I enjoyed uh, Carla's older child being labeled as not Cosmo music. <laughs> <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> 
<laughs> he seemed Poor cool though. Guy. He seemed cool. He seems like I don't know how he old he is, cool. but he seemed like a teenager that was like, I'm too cool for this. And I was like, Well, your mom mm-hmm. is Carla, so I guess that's true. <laughs> yeah, you see Cosmo trying to get in every video and the other son is just like, Please, Please. do not talk to me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh cute. I, when he's older, he'll know because he'll like people he'll be like, Oh, actually, my mom's the best. And I didn't realize it at the Aww. time. <laughs> Aww. He did thank her for the pasta in the pasta episode. He did, but it was mm-hmm. a very begrudging, teenagery type, like, oh, thanks, I guess. Thanks, mom. Thanks for keeping me alive. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow, Emile's kitchen was even weirder than I expected. I expected yeah. it to be weird, but it was even weirder. <laughs> he had was it all the kidneys in the freezer? <laughs> the kidneys, the vermouth from the seventies, the king size Kit Kat that he got really happy about, that little funnel packaging with Pino the sweet nosy or whatever it was called. Oh yeah, like that was so weird. If they do every way to cook kidneys, I'm gonna riot. That is not a video <laughs> anyone needs to have in their lives. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully they won't actually do that. Okay, next video, Gourmet Makes. Pastry chef attempts to make gourmet Cadbury cream eggs. So this came out just in time for Easter, of course. Do you guys call them Cadbury eggs? Because that's what she kept calling them all the way through the video. What do you call them? Cream (laughs) eggs. Because Cadbury's just the brand. Well, Cadbury as a brand, as you know, is way more ubiquitous in the UK whereas yeah. in the US kind of the only Cadbury chocolate that we have is the cream egg oh. or in the last few years the little mini eggs the which mini are egg. delicious yes so not just in the past few years I had those when I was a kid oh really well then it yeah. was just me that I experienced them in the <laughs> past few mini years. eggs are this shit <laughs> they're so good they're a staple of every British Easter um but yeah we don't interestingly we don't really so, so the mini eggs come in like packages, but the the cream eggs Claire was showing at the beginning they seem they seem to also come in packages. Is that right? Because we sell them as like single eggs. It's both. I got yeah, a single either. egg this ah, year. Okay, because I was like, who's buying packages of cream eggs? They're so Margaret what? is our dear <laughs> friend and fan of the show. It, she orders packages. <laughs> Um, But yeah, I just thought it was funny because they kept calling them Cadbury eggs, Cadbury eggs. And I was like, cream eggs, cream eggs. (laughs) (laughs) I'd say either Cadbury eggs or Cadbury cream eggs. Uh, Yes, that's what I would say too. Mm -hmm. Well, I would also, the only other note I have on the differences between the US and the UK is if you think Cadbury's chocolate in the States is good, try it in the UK because your mind will be blown. It is very different. (laughs) Really, really good. Yeah. Actually, I also really like Australian Cadbury yeah, chocolate. Yeah. Very tasty. That's good. I love this video. It was so nice. Mm-hmm. It really was. I think Hunzi even pointed out in this video that it was one of the episodes where it was really clear that she made a gourmet version, that mm. she improved upon the original. So that was something that mm-hmm. I really liked about it. And she called it one big craft project. Yes. And I think that really showed she approached it from a craft standpoint which as we all know she loves and she's so meticulous about and I think it served her really really well yeah totally and she invented a robot <laughs> which I thought was absolutely oh my genius God. so the clever mixing robot the so c-stand <laughs> mixer that's something uh so like filmmakers have this site called shitty rigs where they take like a bunch of things on set where they'll clamp things just to like make a thing to make a thing yeah you know yeah yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. and it reminded me that i'm like you would see this on shitty rigs (laughs) (laughs) that's so fun but it was so like as brad said best thing i've seen all week (laughs) it's tuesday but thanks (laughs) it's tuesday but thanks yeah i love that quote (laughs) I really loved how she did it in real eggshells. I just thought that was absolutely, like, absolutely genius. Like, such a good idea. So much, it just looked, it made the final product look so much cooler because there was no seam. Mm -hmm. Like, it didn't look manufactured. It really looked like Mm -hmm. artisan and skillful. Um, And it really was, um, like, showcasing all of her best, 
uh, abilities in Gourmet makes, I think. Like her ability to make something, elevate something. Because, I mean, I don't know about you guys. Cream eggs are okay. Like I can have one. But after that, I find them so sickly. Like even one these mm-hmm. days is like, because mm-hmm. that in the yeah. inside of it is just so it's just basically pure sugar paste and it's it's yeah. like it really makes me feel a bit ill um but but the way that she was doing it she was really making something that you 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 want to eat and you want to eat more of and the 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 fact that she made it look so I want to say professional, but cream eggs are obviously made professionally. It just looked, it just looked like something you'd order at a restaurant or something and be like really super mm-hmm. surprised at when you, you cut in and it looked like a real egg. And it was just really delightful, really great. I was really impressed by using the actual eggs as a mold too. And I was really surprised, which is another reason why I liked it so much. When she first started blowing out the eggs, I thought that it was going to be a disaster. I thought it wasn't going to work. <laughs> I thought she was overcomplicating it. So I was really pleasantly Have you guys surprised. not blown out eggs before? I've never blown yeah, out an egg. Actually. Have you made chocolate eggs from a blown out egg before? <laughs> no, I don't remember what craft we did with blown out eggs when I was a child. Did you paint <laughs> them or something? making Cadbury cream eggs. <laughs> I think you like decorate them yeah. or something. It's something Easter crafty. You paint yeah, them because then they just last forever as long as you don't accidentally break them. Yeah, they yeah. do that. What do you guys think about the reasons why some of the chocolate bloomed after she kind of picked the eggshell off and some didn't? Because I had a theory that maybe but it was only I only thought about it when she went through the entire recipe at the end. There was a step in there where she puts the blown out shells in a in the dehydrator to get dry obviously um Mm. because she said when she was developing the recipe that water and like tempering chocolate they don't mix too well and I wondered if there was some how some of the shells didn't get completely dry in that process and that was the eggs that ended up getting bloomed chocolate I don't know that was just my my theory but that's a good guess. I actually think that's a better guess than their guess where they said they thought that the membrane maybe changed it, but it didn't look like it was a pattern from leftover membrane. It just mm. looked like it was, it was weird. bloom. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. It, there was a big variation in the end result for sure. Those two that turned out so perfectly smooth and glossy mm. just looked so nice. What you're saying, yeah. LJ, about how it seemed so artisanal and bespoke, I really love that as well. And I like that she incorporated the real eggshell, the real egg yolk, just to sort of call back to the whole egginess of it all. I would really love to have one of these creations because I imagine just like the weight and the heft of it must be so pleasant. (laughs) And even though gold leaf is ridiculous, I actually really liked (laughs) the addition of the gold leaf because I felt like it was a callback to the foil wrapper. Yeah. So that was really nice. I like that as well. And I loved the look of them at the end. I just thought it was really pretty and beautiful and just like a triumph, a total triumph. Standing ovation. (laughs) Yay. My other favorite quote was, didn't you have a robot doing that? Yeah, but I did the thinking. (laughs) (laughs) She did do the thinking and that's half the work. (laughs) Our next video is Pro Chefs Make 13 Kinds of Pantry Pasta, Test Kitchen Talks at Home. So I think Bon Appetit really overestimates how much I have on hand. (laughs) (laughs) Agree. I actually don't have any pasta in my pantry. That must just be me, though. I don't have loads of pasta on hand because Russ doesn't really like it. And... I mean, I love it, but I also can't eat a lot of it without feeling a bit ill, um, IBS problems. But um, I do, and so I do <laughs> tend to get like uh, spelt pasta or like whole grain pasta because that seems to work a little better. And that's harder to get at the moment. So I don't have a super big stock of it or anything. Um, but I do have a lot of other grains that would probably you could do a similar type of idea with for a lot of these things. So I've got loads of like quinoa and lentils and rice and blah, 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 all that other stuff. So I think that the concept and the idea of, of showcasing 
you know you can just go to your pantry and just make do with what's there in in if it's you know well stocked enough and I think this is to kind of give you some ideas of what is good stuff to try and stock up on not stock up as in stockpile but like um do you know what I mean what's good basics mm-hmm. to kind of have on hand that you can kind of remix into something that's greater than the sum of its parts because I mean it was a bit like that bean recipe that I was talking about earlier like that was basically olive oil salt and pepper and tomatoes and some random yeah. herbs and some beans in a can like I would have looked at the, like in previous weeks I would probably have opened my fridge and my pantry and gone well I've got nothing like what am I gonna make Uh, yeah I managed to make something that was delicious because of this recipe so I feel like these this video was inspirational in that way to be like huh well if I just you know maybe use these beans if you just have olive oil and parmesan you can make anything yeah and I I do always have olive oil and parmesan that's in, well until I can't anymore because <laughs> it won't come in my order but uh, that is something yeah. that I generally have around and I just I guess it was just a bit of a kick up the butt for me to be like try harder do you know what I mean try harder to look at what you've got and make something with it because you can you've got a lot of stuff there really yeah I think the main takeaway from this is even if you don't have these exact ingredients mm. here are the elements you need you need fat you need salt you need acid yeah, all the elements. And here's how you can balance it. Maybe you can add some pepper for some spice, or maybe you can add a little bit of citrus to balance out the starchiness. So mm. it was just kind of showing several examples for how you can make do with what you have on hand without needing to go to the store, hopefully. Yeah. Mm. What I really liked about this video were the not test kitchen people brad's wife as the camera operator <laughs> yes. Carla's children being cute priya's mom just off camera judging her yeah <laughs> chris's kids not respecting him <laughs> oh. and andy's emo personality the brightest of things come in the darkest of months <laughs> <laughs> emo so andy robo and me all yeah. you get all sorts of fun people <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. I loved all of those little, uh, I guess, uh, supplemental elements that we're getting from the... And I guess that's what I was trying to say at the beginning. Like, this is part of the reason why I'm really enjoying these Test Kitchen at home videos so much because we're just seeing a bit more of who they all are. And we wouldn't have got any of that if if things had been, you know, this is like a, a bonus, I guess, of them doing these home videos. And it's quite cute. We get to see a lot of cats too, which I really appreciate. Yeah, yeah pets. The pets have been great. And the kids. Uh, although I'm worried about Chris's child joining up to a gang now. <laughs> I think he was trying to be Spider-Man. <laughs> yes, that was Spider-Man, Chris. Yeah, a little web slinging. So Come on, Chris. Claire's chickpea pasta, was. I feel like it was very much a mix between like the Andy's saucy chickpea pasta mm-hmm. and the vegan bean, uh, the white can- cannellini bean pasta that's been on basically. Yeah. They're very, very similar. It looked delicious. I like the idea of that pasta. Um, it's a good idea. I never mm. think to use chickpeas with pasta. I don't know why. I guess because they're, I don't know. I don't actually have, have no idea why. I always think with chickpeas, I'm always like, oh, hummus or I don't know, something like that. Or, or I use them as like the kind of grain as I, as it were, rather than thinking you can put it with a, with a grain. Uh, but, but I love the idea of the crispy the crispy chickpeas on top and like having some of them mixed through the sauce. I thought was a great idea. I think this was my favorite of the pantry pastas as well. It just seemed really thoughtful as far as all the components. And I guess all the BA chefs just really love chickpeas hiding inside of pasta because Andy (laughs) was quite delighted by that as well. They love everything hiding inside of pasta. (laughs) Yeah, Carla with the guanciale hiding in her pasta. Kashari, which I'd not heard of before, really has like all the grains, like rice and pasta and lentils and chickpeas. I was like, wow, yeah. I've never heard of that, but I I like it. I like the sound of it. Seems like it'd be very filling in a good way. Just make a big mm-hmm. batch of something and then eat it forever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you wouldn't even need much Crispy of it. Crispy fried onions. Oh, so good. Mm-hmm. I would like to say that I can confirm that seeing a meal actually eat something and make noises is way less irritating than him pretending <laughs> to do it. <laughs> 
<laughs> as long as he doesn't keep biting the plate. <laughs> I kind of he looked away whilst he was trying his food and was like, why does that noise sound so familiar? And I was like, it's because you hear it all the time. On every <laughs> wow. <thing. laughs> Just the way he goes, mm. <laughs> Oh, well, you could watch him getting his hair cut on his Instagram stories now. <laughs> oh, oh, no. <laughs> okay. We have to tell Amanda about that. <laughs> I'm also extremely relieved that Chris does have a spoon in his apron at home. I was worried there Ooh, for yeah. a hot second. <laughs> <laughs> Some heroes wear aprons. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Next up, we have Brad makes garlic ginger paste. It's alive at home. <laughs> video edition i love the HS edition the new home titles they're so good <laughs> <laughs> this was quite the video <laughs> i've actually watched yeah. this video twice to see now. sola's descent into madness yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah i watched it twice too and i feel like and the first time you watch it you're like this is great this is crazy but then the second time you watch it it really kicks in halfway through yeah solar thing i only hurt on the inside was such a mood i was like <laughs> i know how you feel <laughs> sola is all of us yes oh my god Sola's i'm not hanging us. in there and i'm like yes <laughs> but also i thought it was interesting because uh they're both actually i think brad is thinking that he's fine and he's not that affected but he definitely is because he was like oh you're fine solo just have a shot of whiskey it's no problem but like i didn't think i could see brad go more rambly and like talking to himself than we'd already seen but i guess if anything was gonna do it lockdown was because he's just like talking to himself <laughs> yeah. like making stuff up like re- being like well done brad like i really do know how yeah, he feels stick with me bud <laughs> Throwing it over to his tripod, which he's named Stiff Steve. (laughs) (laughs) So funny. This is what I do if I'm at home alone for too long. I start like talking to inanimate objects that they're my friends. No wonder Sola made like an eyebrad because eyebrad. (laughs) (laughs) The second greatest robot of this batch. I've named the two bees outside my window. (laughs) The two bees. Oh my god. What are their names? One is. Pablo and one is honey. <laughs> honey! Oh my god. <laughs> so good. I approve. So cute. <laughs> Almost as cute as Vito and Clementine, who were also very cute Aww. in this video. Oh, they are great. So Shiba Inu and English Bulldog, I think. I'm not entirely sure what breed Clementine is. Clementine, oh my god, what a lovely slobbery dog. I really love them. <laughs> I think they're so cute. I think it becomes especially clear that both Sola and Brad are losing it because we have the juxtaposition of one week passing. So we have them in the beginning (laughs) and then it's cut to a week later and you can see them. (laughs) You see that a switch has flipped and something's different. That's what I was waiting for. I said that last time too. I was like, yeah, this is when they're first starting to record. Let's let's, let's see them a couple weeks in. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And Brad was saying something about how when he's filming in the test kitchen you get that sort of immediate feedback and people are there to keep you on track and he said that it's really easy to get weird when you're by yourself and it's it like is. yeah this video is kind of the illustration of that mm-hmm. <laughs> I think um like when I first started watching this video I mean I knew it was an it's a live video so there's a certain amount of like you know adjusting for that but I was like he's making garlic ginger paste like how is this gonna take half an hour but I'm so <laughs> really? glad that it did take half it an hour. It gets made twice, essentially. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. But it was it was thoroughly, <laughs> I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was just really relatable and funny and cute. And I just loved it, like, every second. I was, like, I was more than happy to watch it twice. Yeah. But that, um, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, Brad. <laughs> the, what did she the mean? Eye the Brad? shirt. The eye Brad. Yeah. <laughs> With the pencil and the hat, like... And the knife. That, the knife. The knife. <laughs> it was the best thing ever. That was the best thing ever. It was It was definitely the second best robot of this, uh, this <laughs> batch of <episodes. laughs> The only reason it didn't get top spot is because she couldn't quite get the Zoom camera on the iPad to work with Brad's actual face. She no. had to set it in <laughs> the picture. Wouldn't... It was much better with his headshot. But I liked the idea of it. I, I could see what she was trying to do with it, to have a real life talking Brad. <laughs> 
<laughs> as Brad said, she's gone full Wilson on us. <laughs> well, it was just so cute at the end where he was like, Sola, let the Wilson go. And Sola's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> so good. I have to imagine what Sola's husband thinks of all this. Like, you okay, babe? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She spent all weekend making okay. eye Brad and, and then her husband's just in the corner like, I'm right here. Like, you can talk to me. <laughs> right <laughs> you don't have to recreate your friends <laughs> i love it i love, I so love it too <laughs> oh i also love it's very popular in the fandom to compare brad to a golden retriever he is a human golden retriever yes. and is very apt in this video he barks multiple times he barks just thinking about dogs he barks at sola's dogs and his children are barking his children are puppies <laughs> His his feral children. And I love how he's like planning on how he's gonna set them to work in the kitchen one yes. day. Like one day I won't have to do this menial task because I've got all these kids that can do it for me. <laughs> Just put them to work. Yeah. So fun. And then he's like, it's not work, it's family bonding time. <laughs> like trying to justify his thought process. It was hilarious. We'll definitely need an It's Alive of him taking his kids fishing or something. That would be the best. Oh, that would be so cute. So cute. I'd love that. They are very cute kids. Oh, yeah. The other musical homage part I liked in this video was the little hint of the Papa Roach song. Thank you. (laughs) I didn't notice that. When was that? When he's talking about the shrimp. It was like in the later half when he's like, so I cut them into pieces, I think is what he said. And then it did. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, Hunzi, Hunzi, you genius. I love you. <laughs> Such a subtle, like. <laughs> I didn't, I'm going to have to watch it a third time just for that. <laughs> My favorite Hunzi touch was the mango callback. Yes. When... Yes. <laughs> so cute. He added the little avocado illustrations and the O's for yeah. mango. Yeah. yeah. So good. Yeah. How's Hunzi doing? I saw it like on Instagram though. He was a bit sad that he had to edit his friends and not be around them. Sort I know. Of thing. So Aww. sweet. Aww. Not on Instagram, on Twitter. I hope he's okay. I hope everyone's okay. Just generally in yeah. the world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I only hurt on the inside. It's okay. All right. We're going to take a trip back to the past when we were able to go to restaurants with friends. <laughs> trying everything on the menu at a famous New York City sandwich shop featuring Christina Shea. So many sandwiches. (laughs) At first, I was really meh about this video because I think this is our third sandwich shop we've had in this series. So just seeing that at first, I was like, oh, man, more sandwiches. But then I was actually really pleasantly surprised. I think that these sandwiches were really unique. They had really unexpected combinations of ingredients or just ingredients in general. Mm. So the restaurant itself became a lot more interesting than I expected it to. And Christina is just a delight. So I never had any doubt about that. But she was a good duo with Delaney. Yeah. Yeah. I was kind of meh about the restaurant as well. I feel like in previous episodes, they played with the menu more. And then this one was more kind of straightforward. But I did really also like Christina in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I really like Christina in it. I am having used one of these videos to plan a trip to one of these restaurants. I actually am savoring each of these nyc ones for when i next go back at some point in the future when we can travel again which will happen (laughs) i'm sure it's hard to imagine right now but it will um so and i'm seeing them as almost like uh like a travel guide a a compendium of travel guide Mm -hmm. videos for me to be like so next time you go to new york you're going here 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 and you're ordering these three things um and seeing how they get to those conclusions so i'm enjoying it from that perspective because I'm like oh what am I going to be eating when I go there (laughs) um but I did I thought um that like you said uh Meg they've got really unusual combinations there that I wouldn't have thought about and lots of different like sauces and like things Mm -hmm. that they've like added to stuff that I've not really heard of before I also really enjoyed their kind of uh their soda selection yes that they sounded amazing I really want to try those I love a uh, homemade soda um absolutely and yeah I, d- I thought this was a fun video I'm really impressed they managed to get through 
that much food i mean they took a breather obviously which was hilarious um because it wasn't really <laughs> it was like let's go for so a good. walk around the block and christina yes. was just like ah on a bench <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah i mean i love confit meat but i could never eat that much of it <laughs> So much meat. They were saying that they got the meat sweats and Delaney confirmed a couple times that it was the most challenging, yeah. the hardest episode that he had done so far of the series. It really looked So it. yeah, it was a lot of meat, a lot of bread. Yes. It seemed really hard to get through. <laughs> yes. Wow. So well done. I also thought the sodas looked so good. I immediately went online to see if you could buy them online, but they only sell them Aww. wholesale, unfortunately. But that C to C club soda... I'm losing my dang mind. It's a sea salt soda, and it's literally salt from opposite coasts. So they have salt from Maine (laughs) and salt from Oregon, from Jacobson Sea Salt, which they showed on It's Live before. So I would love to get my hands on this somehow. (laughs) Oh, my God. I didn't realize that 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 sounds great. Oh, and the celery one also sounded really interesting as well. I think they all sounded great. That what cheer one sounded like a really spicy ginger soda. We all want the sodas. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Um, Another revelation, um, bacon with oatmeal, question mark, exclamation mark, which is what I wrote down before it even came up on the screen as a quote. (laughs) I was like, what? Why not? Sure. Yeah, I've had a few savory oatmeals in my time and they're pretty good. I've never thought to have oatmeal as a savory food. Like, Nobody told me that that was allowed, as they say. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm not a massive uh, breakfast sandwich fan. So um, I think I would probably want to try that bacony oatmeal thing if I was going there for breakfast. But yeah, I don't I don't like eggs in a sandwich. I think because I don't I like kind of sloppy scrambled eggs. I don't like them like too cooked, but I don't I hate <laughs> soggy bread. So mm. so I'm fine if to have the eggs with like a bread on the side, um but not not in a sandwich or oh. So yeah, I don't I don't like the breakfast oh. sandwiches. But the fishy category I'm learning a lot about you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> the fishy category made me really happy and obviously putting chips or crisps on a sandwich is a a completely like boss move I don't know who came up with that idea to do that but well done yeah I'm all in if there's potato chips on a sandwich Mm -hmm. (laughs) so I'm assuming this means that this deli has made it to your list of places to go yeah definitely it looks really good and I would like to try the it was the second one that they said I forget the name of the second one the, the like the next one or whatever it is that they call the second choice Mm-hmm. Um, the delight, the yes, Ruben the delight. Sandwich. I was like, it's the one with the red, Ooh. pinky, like um, stuff in it. Yeah, it was good. Something that I noticed in this batch of videos that I'm honestly surprised I somehow didn't notice it before is that Delaney always says "yo" when he's introducing himself. Yo, it's always yo. <laughs> he's so hip. The yo. Have you seen his the record bro, collection? The whoa. The- Such a hipster. <laughs> the crow. Such a hipster. <laughs> Another revelation for me was John, J-A-W-N. Yeah. When he said that it means any noun, I'm like, Delaney, you're obviously full of shit. Yeah. What are you even talking about? You're making about? stuff up. But then I went online and he's totally right. It's just a thing, apparently. This is what the internet says. This is what? like we. Yeah, we'd I know. Say, it's insane. We'd say like but a this thingy is... or a that thingamajig or whatever he's saying. Yeah, literally like any it. noun. But this is the definition that the internet provided. Chiefly in Eastern Pennsylvania, used to refer to a thing, place, person, or event that one need not or cannot give a specific name to. Wow. So like pass it. me that, Jean. He was totally right. Color me surprised. <laughs> <laughs> My nan says, what's it? She's like, give me that what's it. Give me that what's name. What would that? And it's just like whatever random thing. Mm, Whatchamacallit. Yeah, all of those things. <laughs> but no, now we can, now we've got a new word. We can say, yeah, John. I don't want it. <laughs> Justine rejects John. (laughs) Okay, our penultimate video. Pro Chef tries butchering a whole pig for the first time. One of the Molly tries. I was not in it at the the thumbnail, but then I like the episode because it's one of those where you go, you see a whole process and she learns like a whole like chain of events sort of things. And I like that. And I like how she says... 
in the video, if you're not comfortable with these like gross squishy parts, you shouldn't be eating this. Right. Mm -hmm. I love that bit as well because that is like my Mm -hmm. vibe entirely. Like it is the reality of eating meat and you should learn about it in order to respect the animal that died so that you could eat it, right? Totally. Has anyone ever butchered an animal before? (laughs) <laughs> just eat like cleaned yeah, a sure. fish <laughs> i've cleaned a fish <laughs> after fishing fish. but that's the extent of what i've done i took my my dad's really i get a lot of my point of view about meat eating from my dad and his views so i knew um one time i was looking for he's really hard to buy for a lot of dads are i think for for birthdays and stuff so one year i think about four years ago i got him a voucher for both of us to go and do a butchery course or, or lesson at um jamie oliver's got a like a butchery or he used to i don't know if he still does um in london um and you can book to go for an afternoon and learn how to butcher different animals um so we didn't do we didn't do a pig but we did do a lamb um so you kind of pay to learn how to do it and to actually do it with one of the guys who works at his restaurants um and you get to take away like what you've butchered and cook with it at home which was I had lamb in my freezer for months it was great um but it was super interesting and I really enjoyed understanding how they sort of portion up the animal to make the best use of what's there and just all of the care Mm. and respect that they they give to it and how you can tell what a well-treated animal is versus not like it was super super interesting and I really enjoyed it and my dad did too so I found I got the same vibe from this this video like it was really clear that Lena you know was very very knowledgeable really cared about and respected the animal um, wanted to get the best out of that animal um, so that a you know their investment in that animal is is maximized but also that you're you know getting the most out of that animal that's you know died to give you food so I thought it was fascinating and I really enjoyed seeing what she did with it all. I think that's great that you took that opportunity. I think it's important to be educated in all aspects of life, including how your food gets to your plate. So that sounds like a really valuable experience to have. So in that class, did you have to go at it with a bone saw like yes. poor Molly did? That's so fucking wow. hard. I can't tell you. <laughs> my dad it who, looked really hard. My dad who has sawed things in the past um was like no long straight because like i think if you're inexperienced with saws like i am i don't ever have to saw anything um you your natural inclination is to like go at it with little short strokes and try and push down but actually you get you're not making them like my dad was like the physics of it is um the long stroke means that you're maximizing Mm -hmm. the use of every kind of effort that you're putting in and actually it gets you through that bone quicker um with less effort Mm -hmm. as as molly explained as well um if you then sort of hammering at it as it were um so yeah i learned that pretty quickly when i was (laughs) doing the land because i was like this isn't going anywhere and my dad was like yeah it's because you need to long strokes um but yeah it's hard work butchering an entire animal on your own like we were kind of taking it there weren't that many of us because obviously um they limit the numbers because there's only so many jobs that anyone can do with one animal but um they kind of divided up who was doing what so you weren't there wasn't just one of you doing an entire animal um it was you kind of divided but even that I was like I'm exhausted I've really worked for this (laughs) (laughs) so I can't imagine like they must you know the people that work in butcher shops and in, in restaurants and stuff that do that kind of thing um you know to do an entire animal frequently is is a big job they must have one really jacked arm like yeah. Lena. <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly so i'm convinced that they gave molly a quiz and a time limit for shopping so that she wouldn't just max out the company credit card <laughs> on a little shopping spree <laughs> like she tends to do she did not seem rushed by her time limit though like she was just like oh i'm kind of on a time crunch like whatever but then she was like not like I would have been like supermarket sweep, like go quick, 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 quick. like ah. But she was not worried about it in the slightest. <laughs> She's a pro. She is a pro. My one criticism of this video, I think, is that um, I, I, I understood that she was demonstrating how to make use of those kind of gems, as Lena put it, like the the prime cuts that maybe people don't often think of to order when they're ordering pork meat um they're sort of cuts that mimic 
um, prime cuts from the, the uh, a, a cow, so beef, um, mm-hmm. which I thought was really interesting. But I would have also liked her liked to see her in this video use some of the cuts that a lot of people discard to showcase how they can be used, like the tongue for. For, for example is something mm-hmm. that Lena did mention that she really liked and it's like nature's mortadella um, but we didn't see that translate into anything at the final product and the tongue is something that and those kind of off cuts that some butchers don't even sell because people won't buy them to really make the most of the opportunity to showcase how they can be used so that people are interested in using them it, I think would be a good idea because the more you can use of an animal obviously the the, the better it is Mm-hmm. Yeah, so instead the takeaway was here's how to prepare pork like beef instead of, as you were saying, here's how to prepare some lesser known off cuts from the animal, which probably would be a better way to showcase the animal because you don't get trotters, for example, with a cow. No. <laughs> and as you mentioned, the tongue, the pig tongue, when they said it was like nature's mortadella, you can't say that and then not have Molly, the queen of mortadella, yeah. make something with pig's tongue. Yeah. It did feel like it led to a path that just sort of dead ended. Yeah. Yeah, I think what, yeah, at the end, she was like, here is pig that's not pork chops. Yeah. And I I don't get the beef with pork chops, pardon the pun, because I really like (laughs) pork chops. (laughs) <laughs> we're having pork chops for dinner tonight like there's nothing wrong with pork chops if you like you can have them nicely cooked and you know stop dissing pork chops but what about pork tenderloin which apparently everyone at the test kitchen hates for some I reason i do pork tenderloin like if it's cooked nicely like what what's wrong <laughs> yeah i don't know <laughs> <laughs> i don't know i think they were being as delaney said they were just being fucking snobs about it i think they were being too yeah. cool i yeah. agree who who you know you're too cool for a pork chop now who do you think you are (laughs) i was going to say that i really love chicharrones until molly pointed out the nipple and i was like "Mm, maybe i'll never have these again (laughs) that just reminded me of that tiktok i just turned to russ and was like even your husband has nipples (laughs) (laughs) oh tiktok I like this style of talking head interview that they use in Molly Tries, and I kind of wish they would adapt it for some other videos, perhaps. Just having her sit in a chair, sort of being kind of casual. I think that it's an interesting way to sort of segue between the videos and for her to yeah. distill mm-hmm. what she's learned. And to share the Tong song. <laughs> tong song. Tong that song. was my first email address. Not Tongs, but it was that thong <laughs> 25 at hotmail.com. <laughs> What? Why? <laughs> because Why? I was like 13 Why? and I thought it was cool. <laughs> no. I know oh that now, God. Justine. We're learning so uh, much about LJ. Okay. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> I was stupid. Leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> All right. For our final video, we have a new series, question mark. Three chefs cook pasta carbonara three ways. Traditional, modern, experimental. I love this series. I want it. I want it. I, want it. I know it's so good. <laughs> I love it so much. It's like a mini version of Making Perfect, but better because it's like lots of different ways. Ooh. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Like the stuff they were doing with the, the Venn diagram. I mean, we can always use more Venn diagrams Ooh. in our lives. Like the stuff they were doing mm. there really reminded me of like their brainstorming phase in Making Perfect. And I always really enjoyed that part. Um, I wanted yes. more detail of the Venn diagram. We should have spent more time with it because I noticed that we got close-up shots of what a carbonara is and breaking that down and then also Mm -hmm. of their ideas for their specific circles on the Venn diagram but they also had stuff in the kind of intersections as well and I was like I want to know what those Mm. are and I couldn't quite see when I paused it because there was obviously overlap between pairings as well so more Venn diagram (laughs) content (laughs) that's what I'm here for. (laughs) I really like this too my top three favorite things about this is number one it's informative and educational and technical like you were saying it really takes a deep dive on the dish but more than just saying here's the ingredients it really illustrates here are the elements of the Mm. dish here's what's elemental to pasta carbonara and how Mm. you can kind of tweak that the second Mm -hmm. thing i really liked about it is that it really allows the chefs to be super duper creative without 
gimmicks and without the limitation of having to develop a recipe for the home chef. Mm. Obviously, Mm -hmm. the traditional recipe, they already have that available for us at home. But the modern, the experimental, they just get to go hog wild and not have to worry about anyone needing to recreate it. Yeah. And even though it's kind of framed as a competition, this was my last takeaway, was that it's not really a competition. There was a time limit that they sort of hinted at, but it's not like there was a clock in the corner that was like, you only have half an hour left, and they were helping each other, even if Chris accidentally sabotaged (laughs) Sola. (laughs) But those are my main things that I really liked about it. Sola is so clever. I was just like, Yes. Who yes. takes carbonara and makes it into a dessert? Like it, it's well, obviously chefs do, but like it's. I've had that was amazing. It was so clever. Just it was such a great idea, and yeah, just the just the way their minds work is just insane. Like I would never, I could never. I mean, this is why I'm not a chef, but like I would never think, oh yeah, sure, eggs. So ice cream, obviously, but it makes so much sense <laughs> because you do make ice cream with eggs, and also um. Uh, the 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 bacon into the not the bacon the guanciale into the, like the caramel genius like mm-hmm. all of it was so mm-hmm. clever and I was so impressed with that. She's like a food wizard when she was like the spaghetti is gonna puff up in an instant and then it goes to the pot and it's just like puff it's so <laughs> like magic. I just wow. I just thought it was a brilliant idea for to to go dessert as as the, mm-hmm. as the kind of direction. I thought it was insane um so good Mm -hmm. but then she also threw away her pasta water so she's not that clever (laughs) rookie mistake (laughs) if when they do a second episode do you want to see the same three people or do you think they would trade out who the three people are so i would want to see the same three people but i think that they will probably swap out the chefs is my guess I think they all were very well suited to the category that they had assigned. Um, I don't. It's not to say that I don't think they could have done the other categories. I just think it suited mm-hmm. their personality well or, or best. Yes. Um. So Carla is brilliant at like um knowing the history of a dish and be able to cook a super traditional take on on an Italian dish. I think Chris's inclination is to do more of a modern take and and Sola is known for being, I don't know, she's done like the most complicated dishes on basically baking. Like she does have some really cool new ideas to bring to the table on stuff. I I don't, I do think they could have operated in any of those categories and done a good job. I just think it really suited them in the categories that they had. So yeah, I would love to see the same people in those categories next time but I think I'd also be interested to see it switch up as well like I don't know I haven't seen the switch up yet and I'm I, I love all of them so happy to see new people yeah definitely fits their personalities Carla is just kind of a relaxed person it seems like she really shines with simple homey food although we know that she's capable of more than just traditional but like we've said before the way that she communicates with the viewer is really mm. suited for traditional and Chris, of course, with his ability to dissect a recipe and really go from all the elemental components as we see in the reverse engineering, I think that makes him really suited for the modern category as well. Yeah. I think Sola might have had some education in food science, but don't quote me on that. Either that or she's just like magic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> She's a magical food wizard. I actually was not into Chris's dish at all. It grossed me oh. out. Oh, <laughs> was that the raw, like the barely cooked yolk that was the issue, or was it other stuff? It was the barely cooked yolk on top of the the ham fat. Oh, <laughs> for the inside. that just sounds delicious yes. to me. <laughs> I was gonna say for I'm me, like, I'm like, Ugh. Ugh. <laughs> I have actually had it carbonara. Me out. I've had carbonaras in Italy and in Italian restaurants that don't mix in the yolk until it's like by the side, like it's plated up. Like they'll put the raw oak, (laughs) they'll put the raw (laughs) yolk on the top of the pasta dish with the parmesan and the, the pork all mixed in and then they'll mix it in and it will kind of just cook at, at the at the Mm -hmm. side of the table so the raw yolk didn't and it's delicious but the raw yolk didn't freak me out because I love a 
barely cooked yolk. I love a dippy, dippy Me too. yolk. <clears throat> um, but you know, everyone's different, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> uh there is a vegan place well there's a place near me that does food any type of dietary restriction that you need and they do a vegan carbonara Ooh. and i've had it there and it is amazing it's the first carbonara i've ever had <gasps> yeah and it made me think of i mean like yeah now i've got like I know what it tastes like to me by having right. the vegan version, but like now I know what it actually is. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. How do they make it vegan then? What do they do instead of like the egg and the meat and the cheese? Um, that I don't know. Oh, they they, <laughs> they do have a, a fake meat in there, but I didn't know that there was supposed to be any sort of like egginess to it. I didn't right. get any sense of that. I can look mm. into it now and be like oh this is what they're trading for that but before that i didn't know really what it was that's that's interesting yeah i think uh it's an interesting challenge to veganize something because obviously so many of the components are non-vegan um i always find it amazing when vegan chefs manage to do a a stand-up job of recreating it yeah and actually i've gotten into it now i like it so much at that place i tried it at a i tried a vegan carbonara at another vegan place this was shortly before we went into lockdown um and it was not Mm -hmm. as good (laughs) oh interesting (laughs) did you guys watch through to the very end after the bon appetit card yeah. With the hard rock coffee preparation. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I was like, <laughs> yes. I always do that, but I can't remember what it is. But yeah, yeah, you're right. Uh, hilarious, obviously. And <laughs> I think that was the main reason we ended up having Test Kitchen at home coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's their last, last hurrah for giving Delaney Aww. and Chris a platform to talk about coffee. <laughs> Those guys and their coffee. Before we wrap up, I just have to say my absolute favorite part of this video was Sola leaving Hunzi hanging on that high five. Oh my <laughs> god, I laughed so much. It was hilarious. His uh. little face. <laughs> <laughs> How could you, Sola? How could you? <laughs> Poor Hunzi. <laughs> After all he does for you. <laughs> All right, now that we've recapped that latest batch of videos, we're going to talk about what our favorite video was and what dish we would be most likely to make. LJ, how about you start us off? Oh my goodness, right. Um, It's really hard. I think my two favorites were the Three Chefs new series. Um, I loved that video and I'm really excited for that to be a series. Um, Although it'll be interesting to see how they do it they can do it from home I can see you know it's possible um but yeah whether they will continue to do it from home I don't know um but I think I'm gonna have to go with my fave fave being the it's alive Brad makes garlic ginger paste (laughs) because I just it was so funny it was and I watched it twice and I just it was just really comforting and the struggle was real for both of them being at home and I really related to that and it was also really funny and entertaining and Actually, uh, both my husband and I just turned to our, uh, we've just had a delivery of garlic and ginger in our groceries this weekend. And we were like, maybe we should do that. So we might be doing that. (laughs) That's not what I'm going to choose for my um, dish, though. Um, I think I'm going to choose the Neapolitan chicken. Because although it wasn't like a super, super interesting, engaging video, I thought the recipe looked really good. And I didn't think it looked that difficult to recreate from home. So during these trying times. And it was the only recipe video in this whole batch. (laughs) Sure. But um, that was, I did, I did, that was my main takeaway from that video was like, this is delicious and I can make this easily. So, yeah. I agree um, with you, LJ, that I think the two top videos are the It's Alive and the Carbonara Three Ways. I'm going to swing towards the Carbonara Three Ways as my favorite video of the bunch. It was just so exciting when it just popped up in my feed and I just had to watch it right away. And the whole time I was just like, my face was so happy. I was like, oh my God, it's amazing. (laughs) What? I love it so much. So that was my favorite. Um, as for what I would make, I I would make some pantry pasta. I like um do what it. Claire and what Andy <laughs> were making. So I do have some chickpeas in my cupboard. <laughs> nice. 
Well, we're obviously all in the same boat because I was really torn between the carbonara three ways and the it's alive ginger garlic paste. I think ultimately I have to swing towards it's alive because it was so funny. And it was also the one that I watched multiple times. I just can't get over the eye, Brad. So good. (laughs) (laughs) As far as recipes go, I would probably go with the pantry pasta as well. Claire's looked really good. And I actually really liked Christina's mackerel one. It seemed like sort of a fancy tuna casserole, maybe. So maybe one of those, although I don't have the ingredients for either. (laughs) So I guess my third option is the Boulevardier cocktail that Delaney gave to Molly in the Molly Tries video during the Delaney drink drop. So that's just bourbon, Campari, vermouth, and an orange peel, which I do have all the ingredients for. (laughs) Deep cut. Do it. (laughs) Next drink drop. Yes. (laughs) Part of my quarantine cocktail challenge. All right. So that's going to do it for the videos. As always, we want to thank everyone who has reached out to us on social media, on Twitter, Instagram, wherever. We would like to shout out some of you. Thank you for listening. First, we have Lemon's Test Kitchen and Heidi from Vibrant Visionaries Podcast. They both followed along with LJ's Basically Baking videos on Instagram. And I guess also thank you to Sarah Jampel. Yeah. (laughs) Because she follows along as well. Don't know if she's a listener, however. Big thanks to Alvaro on Twitter, who shared their photo of BA's best lasagna. And Alvaro said they wanted to share it with us because they didn't have anyone else to share it with and thought we would enjoy it. And you absolutely thought, right, we loved it. We always want to see what you're cooking. And we're really touched that you wanted to share it with us. So thank you. Liz, thank you for tagging us on a lot of your BA dishes that you make. That's pretty great. And also, Liz shared a hilarious and uh, scatological review of basically carrot cake. (laughs) It was pretty funny. Thank you to Doug Green for pointing out that Brad and his wife really missed an opportunity to name one of their kids Allison slash (laughs) Allison. Drunk Dish Podcast doesn't get gold leaf. Like why? (laughs) (laughs) For pretty. (laughs) Thanks as always to Margaret for interacting with us, but especially thank you for live tweeting our episode as she listened that was great i loved it i really I feel delighted. like that's a yes. podcast milestone when people start live tweeting your episode <laughs> <laughs> i for one really enjoyed it and thanks to max firestorm bad appetite and may or for weighing in on some of our posts on twitter thanks to everyone i'm sorry if we missed anybody but know that we see all of your comments and we really appreciate all of them And we also really appreciate reviews. So if you're listening to us and enjoying Pod Appetit, please head on over to Apple Podcasts, leave us a positive review, and we'll read it right here and get to thank you personally. So that's probably going to do it for this episode. Join us in a couple weeks for another recap of the last couple of weeks of Bon Appetit videos. As we've mentioned before, we're taking it a little bit easy on ourselves, not really doing side dish episodes at this point because it's a little hard to source ingredients. And also we just kind of want to be kind to ourselves. So be kind to yourselves as well. Please enjoy and look for another recap in a couple weeks. Be kind. Don't go insane. Bon appetit. Bye. (laughs) Take a shot of whiskey. Thanks for listening to Pot Appetit, a Bon Appetit fan cast. We'd love to hear from you, so find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest at pod underscore appetit. And on Facebook at Pod Appetit Podcast. You can also email us at podappetitpodcast at gmail.com and find all of our episodes on our website, podappetitpodcast.com. Until next time, the test kitchen is closed. Hi, I'm April. And I'm Steph. We're the hosts of The Thirst, a pop culture podcast that examines TV, film, music, books, celebrity culture, and pretty much anything in between. Each episode, we pick our favourite pop culture news to discuss the important stuff, like who made the Forbes richest celebrity list and whether Jake Gyllenhaal has a secret Instagram for his cat. We also review the things we've been loving or hating recently, such as the newest Netflix miniseries or the latest instalment in a certain world-dominating comic book universe. And we always make room for a deep dive into the pop culture that defines all of us, whether that's our favourite high school movies, most memorable music videos, or the life-defining Hollywood kisses. There's also a lot of room for thirsty takes on extremely attractive celebrities. 
a lot. Listener participation is advised. You can download our episodes from wherever you listen to your podcast iTunes, Stitcher and Spotify included. And make sure you follow us on Twitter at The Thirst, Instagram at The Thirst Pod and by searching The Thirst on Facebook.